Okay, uh, good morning and thanks for joining us today for this session on network security at scale. I am Bernard Van der Waal. I'm a principal software engineer at Splunk and I work on operationalizing at scale Kubernetes, Istio and Envoy. I used to do this at Cruise previously and my whole career was in between networking and software engineering. And uh, my name is Mitch Connors. I'm a principal software engineer at Aviatrix, where I am working on the Istio project. Uh, I've been a member of the Istio project since 2018, currently serving on the technical oversight committee. I'm also a local here to Seattle, which means that uh, I can give you Istio swag, I can answer any questions you have about the project, about Aviatrix, where I work, or I can give you really good restaurant recommendations for the area. So come <laughs> chat with me after. Very nice. Um, and so today we want to talk to you about Splunk Cloud and the story behind it. So Splunk Cloud is basically a redesign of Splunk to be cloud native. So we wanted to standardize it on the Kubernetes API. And we wanted to be cloud agnostic as much as possible. And today we run both in AWS and GCP, mainly in AWS. Um, we run in about 35 clusters all over the world in all regions of AWS pretty much. And the tech stack we are going to talk about today is Kubernetes, Istio, and Envoy, mainly. And so if you look at the agenda, I think our goal today is to tell you a generic story and go in detail into each of the layers um, that you deal with when you manage the network of such a cloud deployment. And I think it's uh, especially confusing because to some level, you can configure networking policies on the cloud provider, on your VPC, you can also configure network policies on Kubernetes, and you can do that on Istio as well, right? So I think what we want to do today is to go into each of those layers and explore what you can do. Our goal today is to make it as generic as possible, so it's not really tied to Splunk, even though it's what we use. Okay, so let's start with the cloud provider level. This is for us AWS and GCP. Um, so we deploy our clusters into standard VPCs. So we use a cookie cutter VPC, um, one cluster per VPC typically. And the goal is it gives us some level of networking sandbox for our clusters. Um, we deploy our VPCs with three different set of subnets. So we got typically a bunch of private subnets which will be used for the Kubernetes workloads. That's where we want to have our nodes running and at the end of the day the pods as well. We do this because we want the private subnet, as the name says, to be fully isolated from anything else. And then we got public subnets for internet connectivity. Um, that's where we want anything ingress or egress coming from internet to go through. And we got internal subnets for connectivity inside Splunk or to other clusters. And this brings me to the first knob that you can use for security, which is network ACLs. So pretty much every cloud provider supports this. Those are very low-level crude uh, ACLs. They are stateless, so they don't really take into account already open connections. Um, the issue here is they get applied per subnet, which means you pretty much need to um, allow everything that any of your instances will eventually require, because you can only apply on the subnet level. You cannot specify specific instances. They give you very basic layer three and layer four capabilities, meaning you can match on IP and ports, both on the source and destination. And I pretty much see them as a kind of catch-all last resort set of rules. The way we use them, for example, is on the internal subnet, you never want to see anything else than the IP, uh, IP private range like 10 slash eight, the RFC 1918 IP range. So we default, we, by default, we deny everything except traffic with those source IPs. We do the same thing for the private subnets, and we also explicitly allow some traffic coming from internet from specific ports for anything ingress, like 443. Okay, so on the private subnets, we will deploy node groups. Those are the Kubernetes nodes, typically, and we will group them into different functions, into those node groups. Uh, for example, we got ingress node groups, that's where we want to deploy our ingress gateways, where we will run Envoy eventually. We'll talk more about this later. We also got some generic uh, node groups and workload-specific node groups. All of those get deployed into a private IP space because, again, we never want anything 
outside reach, reaching out directly to those node groups. And so doing this gives you the ability to use something else that most cloud providers support, which is security groups. So security groups are, are kind of network ACLs++. Plus plus. First of all, they are stateful, so they, they support connection-based. Um, you can also apply them per instance, which means you can do more fine-grained things like this. Um, we want, for example, to fully isolate the generic node groups and only allow connection in to the ingress node group. And so what we do is we apply a very locked down security group to the generic node groups and a slightly relaxed security group to the ingress node groups. And so this basically forces anything coming into the cluster to transit through those ingress node groups. Um, the other good thing with security groups is they allow you to use a slightly higher level syntax. You can use other security groups as source or destinations. Um, for ingress connectivity, we want everything to go to our NLB and ingress gateways and ingress node groups. So what we do is we deploy basically a bunch of NLBs into those public and internal subnets. Um, the public NLBs are obviously made for public internet connectivity and we use internal, internal NLBs for anything that needs to be reached from inside Splunk. Those will be IP'd on the 10 slash 8 IP space, obviously. And what they do is they basically target the ingress node group, and the ingress node group will run the, the Envoy gateways that will terminate connections and proxy traffic upstream inside the cluster. So for internal traffic, once you've hit the NLB uh, inside the internal subnet, you still need a way to get to another cluster. Another cluster lives in another VPC. So uh, for that, uh, they're using um, AWS transit gateways. Those are advertising only the internal subnet source IPs. So those private subnet, public subnet IPs are not getting advertised across that transit gateway. Uh, and of course, this transits through the Splunk firewall where security rules can be applied. In addition, there's a number of shared services that every cluster needs to be able to access, and they need to be able to access it without transiting an NLB. So for, for these cases, uh, Splunk is using Aviatrix. Aviatrix apply, uh, allows a flat network at layer three, where all of the clusters directly from their private subnets can access those shared services across the Aviatrix transit gateway. And of course, once you've established uh, peering so that your pods can access those shared services, uh, Aviatrix by default would allow those pods to communicate with one another, which of course would bypass all of the rules that we've set up in our internal subnet. So in order to prevent that, uh, Splunk has used Aviatrix's um, network domains feature, which simply allows you to say, this VPC can talk to that VPC, that VPC can talk to the other, but certain VPCs can't. So in this case, you see a diagram where like the blue cannot talk to the green and the green cannot talk to the blue, but we have a number of shared VPCs that are both blue and green that are accessible from all. And that's the setup that Splunk is using there. Okay. Um, so let's look at the next layer, which is Kubernetes. So first of all, our Kubernetes deployment at Splunk, we treat it as a full self-service platform, which means that teams own a namespace, they can, they can do whatever they want with the Kubernetes API, they can provision objects, CRDs for STO, et cetera, et cetera. Um, our goal as a platform team is to provide some level of base capabilities like networking, security, observability, et cetera. One of the things we try to do, obviously, is for the service teams not shoot themselves into the foot. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of examples on how we do that. Um, first of all, one of the things we mandate is any ingress connectivity, uh, both internal or external, needs to go to our NLBs, ingress nodes, and ingress gateway. That's a way for us to apply security into a central point. Um, another note as well is once you, you get to the Kubernetes layer, you do pod-to-pod -pod communication as well. This is mainly invisible to the cloud provider, right? Most of the time you use tunneling um, services like Calico or Cilium. And yeah, that adds some level of complexity. So one thing we do, um, we use quite heavily some validating webhooks. So the goal of a validating webhook is it's basically a callback from Kubernetes API. Um, whenever a CRUD, a create, update, or delete of a specific object is being performed, 
And so we use this in order to validate that users use those objects correctly. A typical example is um, for a service of type load balancer. You, by default, Kubernetes will create an NLB if you use a service of type load balancer. We absolutely want to block this, right? Since, again, we want to force traffic to go to our NLB and ingress nodes. And so we use those validating webhooks, that's just one example, in order to enforce those things. Um, there, there are plenty of open implementations of those validating webhooks. OPA is one example. I used to use KVL at Cruise, which is a good open source alternative. In this case, we, we create our own ones, but they're pretty easy to implement. Okay, so next thing is network policies on Kubernetes. So those network policies on Kubernetes are very Kubernetes-centric. It's basically a CRD defined inside Kubernetes. Um, they allow you to use the Kubernetes syntax, which means you can use labels in order to select pods so that you don't have to explicitly uh, define the IPs of each pod you want to match on. Those are by default implemented by your CNI plugin, something like Cilium or Calico. And a typical example is something like this, right, in which you have a two-tier application and you want the backend to be able to be reached from inside its own namespace, and you maybe want as well connectivity from a front end, right? And so you, you are able to select namespaces and pods based on labels, and you can end up with something like this. All right, so far we've talked about from VPC level at layer three up to Kubernetes policy, how security is applied at each of these layers to scale uh, up to the level that Splunk requires. Now we're gonna look at layer seven. And for that, is, uh, Splunk is using the Istio project. If you're unfamiliar with Istio, it's a service mesh. And lots of people have attempted to explain what a service mesh is. It can all seem very confusing and hype. At a, at a fundamental layer, this allows application layer, application layer networking abstractions over your network. So if you wanna talk about your network not in terms of this IP and port can talk to that IP and port, but instead in terms of this service identity can talk to that service identity, you want a service mesh. If you want something that can globally collect telemetry and say something along the lines of HTTP requests with this path and this verb are succeeding this percent of the time, you want application layer networking abstractions. You want a service mesh. Um, you can also play with routing a little bit and say perhaps our premium tier users are routed to a subset of this service which we know to run on a little bit better hardware and be a little bit faster. Uh, that's what Istio does. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about how Istio does this and then we're gonna look at how Splunk is leveraging Istio. Well, all of the magic of Istio comes from Envoy. We insert an Envoy sidecar into every single application pod, which means that this diagram isn't quite correct. If we were to correct it, it would probably look a little bit more like this. Uh, there's a lot of application pods in your average service mesh, which means there's a lot of Envoy sidecars. We're running Envoy everywhere. But the advantage is that means that we have control over all of the network traffic. We can collect telemetry over all of the networking traffic. And so the trade-offs, in Splunk's case, have been worthwhile. Uh, one of the key things that Istio offers for Splunk is in-transit encryption without any need to modify applications. So the applications are sending plain text HTTP as far as they know. The Envoy sidecar will intercept and apply mutual TLS to that traffic so that it may not be intercepted or modified in transit. Um, you can run Istio in strict mode, which requires that MTLS apply to all traffic. Occasionally, you'll run into some hiccups there. So Splunk runs in permissive mode, which means it will attempt to use MTLS and fail back to uh, plain text if necessary. And then they have this fancy alert setup that lets them know when there's traffic that's happening in plain text so that they can alert their security team. Rather than blocking it proactively, they'd rather have developers respond to that plain text and correct the problem. Yeah, so I think one interesting thing to talk about is the way we provision gateways uh, in our ingress story, because this is going to be the, the ingress point for anything into the cluster, right? So as we said before, we want anything that comes in to go to NLBs, because that allows us to, or NLBs and ingress gateways, because then we can apply a new uniform security policy to it. Uh, 
What we do is we deploy basically NLBs and gateways together. So the gateways will be Envoy running on ingress nodes uh, based on the source of the traffic you want to ingest. For example, if you want to public traffic, you obviously will deploy your NLB on the public subnets. For the internal traffic, your NLB needs to be on the internal subnets. What we also do, obviously, for security reasons and blast radius reasons, is sometimes we deploy NLB and gateways for very critical applications. We also shard tenants sometimes across multiple NLBs when we reach a critical mass. And we do this so that in case gateways go down, hopefully it doesn't happen too often, it doesn't take down the whole cluster. Uh, those gateways are managed by us as a platform team. We run them into the Istio gateway namespace, and it's basically a capability that we offer to everyone into the, the, the cluster. They can basically plug into it. And the way we do this is, while well, we use Istio, um, we set up gateway, so Istio is going to program Envoy as a gateway, and we set up those gateways through the Istio CRDs, like gateway CRD. So a gateway CRD will basically define which host name and which port you expect traffic on. Uh, we also provision those gateway CRDs with certificates um, so that we enforce TLS by default, right? Um, and then we allow our users into the, um, uh, into the cluster to plug into those gateways. Again, th this is gated through a validating webhook so that not any namespace can connect on any host name. They need to be pre-validated in some ways. Again, we want everything to be self-service except the critical parts like the, those host name and ports open to internet. And so we quickly realized something, which is that users had to, to create and provision a lot of CRDs and objects on Kubernetes. And this was leading us to see a lot of mini security incidents, I would say, in which people would configure things wrongly. So we moved forward by creating a service abstraction layer, which is essentially a controller, which will attempt to configure everything for you, um, all those complex objects. The way we did it is we allowed teams to provision an open API spec, and this controller is going to scrape that spec and create the virtual services, destination rules, gateway, all the Kubernetes objects you require to get end-to-end -end networking connectivity. It will also manage certificates, so generate a certificate for your hostname if it's allowed, and set up DNS that goes directly to the right NLB. So this is pretty much for us a one-click deploy solution for the network end-to-end, -end, if you use those specs that we defined. Um, and we see it as a way to make our clusters more secure since it reduces configuration errors. Okay. Something else I would like to talk about is some level of layer seven authentication. So we wanted to provide in our clusters a standard way to do uh, OTEN, so authentication. We do this by leveraging a, a spec from Envoy called X.Z. So X.Z is defined by the Envoy project. So we do this outside Istio. Um, it's basically a way to get a sync call whenever you hit Envoy. Um, where you reach out to an X2Z server with the headers of the request, and the X2Z server will decide if it's allowed, denied, or in some case, you can even modify the, the request headers. So what we did is we developed a bunch of X2Z proxies that, we, that act as an X2Z server, and those will allow a bunch of plugins to plug in. And so we developed those plugins based on what our tenants need. For example, we have an authentication plugin which will validate, in some cases, your bearer token for HTTP. We got some JWT talk, uh, plugins, and we got things like Kota plugins, which will make sure that a specific tenant doesn't issue more than a specific amount of RPS. The good thing is this is enforced on the gateway before going into the cluster. Our goal is to basically drop any bogus requests before they get upstream further into the cluster. Um, I mean, I highly recommend X2Z. It was a super easy protocol to implement. Um, the workloads upstream into the pod still need to re-verify the identity, though. This is just a way for us to stop large-scale DDoSs in some ways or to block anything that should not get into the cluster. So other things we use Istio for is we also use some level of network policies, um, some allow lists. 
once you reach the Istio level, you can basically start mixing and matching layer four and layer seven concepts. Um, and we do this quite often. It's not super clean, but it allows us to do things like defining a, a bunch of source IPs that should be able to go to specific paths and host names for a service, for example. So the higher level you go into the stack, the more concepts you can use to provide those network policies. Other things that some of our tenants do on the cluster is they use some request authentication CRDs to define some JWT hosts and validate that any request coming into their um, workload is got a correct token associated into their headers. And so, yeah, for this, at this point, I want to take a, a step back and look at the life of an ingress request. So this is basically an end-to-end -end request coming to our gateways, going um, to the envoy uh, x.z, and then being proxied to the upstream workload. So if we, if we take a step back, um, any policies applied on the VPC and Kubernetes level are applied per connections. Any policies on Istio are applied per request, pretty much. Um, so your client, when they send us a request, they first open a connection to our NLB. The NLB will layer three proxy this to one of our ingress nodes. This will end up into our Envoy gateway that will terminate TLS, and then we'll inspect the request on a layer seven. Um, they will use X2Z to validate that it's a correct request and it should get into the cluster. If it's allowed, the Envoy gateway will proxy it upstream. At that point, the network policies from Kubernetes will kick in again to make sure that this proxying to the upstream pod is allowed. And then the upstream sidecar on the workload will again look at the layer seven request. And if allowed, it will be decapsulated and sent to the workload in clear text. When we do this, we use a public certificate uh, on the front end. That's what your clients will see. Typically through Let's Encrypt or a bunch of other providers we use. Um, and we use fully MTLS in transit encryption inside our clusters. We use a Splunk internal CA for that. All right. So that was a lot of layers of security. Uh, and as you can imagine, not all of it is as wonderful as one might expect. Let's talk about a couple of particular pain points in the security stack and what we're doing to resolve them. Uh, that slide that we had earlier with like a million Envoy instances on it, uh, it looked bad and that's on purpose. Um, running one proxy per instance of your application, you're gonna run into scalability problems. Uh, for one, compute cost is very substantial for that many proxies. Uh, for two, in some cases, you're gonna want some Envoy instances to have more resources than others. Uh, that's very difficult to pull off with Istio today and to get the tuning done right. Um, obviously, we need to capture all traffic, but there may be more efficient ways, and we'll look at that in a little bit, that we can capture all of uh, the tra traffic across um, envoys. There's also a lot of magic involved in Istio today. Uh, I've, I've pulled this uh, quote from the istio.io documentation site, and this last sentence here, any new pods that are created in that namespace will automatically have a sidecar added to them. It's magic, it's really cool. What about the old pods? Um, okay, well, we don't do anything to those pods. Those pods are immutable, we can't do anything to those pods. So you've gotta go through, every time you change something about what's gonna get injected in a pod or a namespace, you've gotta go through and restart that workload. Don't miss a workload, you might be rolling out a critical vulnerability fix that you're gonna rely on, and if you forget to restart your workload, your Istio upgrade will have succeeded, everything looks good, and you're still 100% vulnerable on the wire. Um, so we, we think we could do better. Also, just answering the question, which Envoy am I running where, uh, can be challenging. So the Istio project is aware of these challenges, and we believe that we have a solution for them we are developing ambient mode for Istio, where uh, all of our layer four technology, all of that MTLS magic that we talked about, will happen in a daemon set that runs on every node and serves every pod on the node. So no more sidecar. All of the traffic capture happens outside of the application pod. Um, that Z tunnel should do very little, only layer four functionality. 
which means it should be much less susceptible to CVEs, much less susceptible to upgrade breakages, et cetera, should be safer to run. Uh, then if you want layer seven magic as well, you can still run an Envoy, uh, but it won't run as a sidecar. It'll run as its own deployment in the namespace. The Z tunnel will take care of redirecting traffic from whatever application needs it into the Envoy sidecar where we can apply all of the L7 magic that you've come to know and love from Istio, but not one per instance. You can scale that Envoy installation independently of the application scale. You can adjust its resource utilization or allocation. Um, our pods will match our deployment spec, <laughs> finally, uh, which doesn't really happen with injection today. If you'd like more information on Ambient or you're interested in getting involved, you can check out the blog post below. All right, so let's, let's look in the rear view mirror. This was a lot of information to cover in a pretty short time. We're doing good on time. Uh, at every single layer of the network, from the cloud provider and VPC level and layer three, to the Kubernetes policy, to Istio at layer seven, we have to solve for identity, policy, and observability. Uh, now, it, it, this looks redundant, right? We've already done identity at layer three. Why are we doing it again at layer four and then again at layer seven? That's computationally expensive. Um, the reason for that is uh, that security is about layers. <laughs> Every layer is always going to have holes, and, and this is your slide, so I'll let you take it sure. from there. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the key things is that we learn over time is uh, defense in depth. So what we want to do is, there is redundant things you can cover in each layer. The best way is to close them down each the most you can and to make sense, so that you have that Swiss cheese model, right, in which um, if by mistake one Secret incidents happen at one layer, hopefully the next layer is going to catch it. Um, the things we learned as well is um, that self-service platforms are really hard. So the best thing you can do is to put safeguards in place to avoid your users doing stupid things. Um, most of the security incidents we've seen is basically users misconfiguring things. So over time, what we try to do is to block those things one by one. The one way to do this is to provide a golden path that will avoid those configurations. That's what we did with a self-service abstraction layer so that we can kind of ensure that people do the right thing by default. Finally, I will close by saying that for us, observability was key. That's how we detect security incidents. Um, we have a bunch of alerts. We get paged if any public traffic is discovered in some VPCs, for example. Um, it's also very useful for helping our users debug at the end of the day because there are so many layers and nobody understands all of them. I think that's pretty much it. Uh, I think this goes to a feedback form if you want, and we'll take some questions. Also give a brief plug, if you're an Istio user, we're going to have our first ever Istio day at KubeCon Europe as a co-located event, and the, the request call for papers is currently open for another week and a half, so uh, submit your talks. Yeah, Rob. Uh, Bernard, you mentioned that there were some mini security incidents when application teams were using the CRDs directly. Uh, can you talk about how you identified those things? Maybe a few alerts in place let you know when that shouldn't happen? Yeah, I mean, a typical example is, I, it's not really a mini security incident, but it's, so with Istio, you can, for example, look at your pass-through cluster if you don't use a fully strict uh, encryption in transit. Um, and you will see anything that doesn't use MTLS go through that cluster, right? And so that's how we identify those. As soon as we see some traffic on this, we alert, I mean, alerts us, it alerts the team as well, right? Um, it's, it's a weird trade-off between productivity. You don't want to block people doing what they need to do, uh, but also being secure, right? So this, we are looking at moving to strict, um, but at this time, we are like still in permissive, yeah. Yes, in the back. Um, that's a really good question I have as well, to be honest. Um, I think it's a mix of historical reasons and validation webhook being really easy to, to deploy yourself. I mean, it's, the code is really simple. Um, but yes, we are maybe looking at consolidating. That's why I mentioned it to appear. I think 
I used KRail in the past as well, which is also a similar project, which is very Kubernetes-centric. Any other questions on the stack? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I mean, we try to to keep our cloud deployments on layer three, layer four, so we don't use things like layer seven gateways on the cloud, for example. Everything comes into our Envoy gateway, and we do everything at that level. Um, yeah, but we are. I mean, I guess we are always looking at what could be done. But at this point, yes, we yeah we try really strongly to be cloud agnostic, so that the Kubernetes API is our point of reference. Yeah. And that actually is how Aviatrix achieves a lot of it, its features within the networking stack is by providing one central abstraction over the cloud provider specific implementations of security. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all for coming to our talk. Uh, we'll be around for uh, questions or restaurant recommendations after. <laughs>